Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Chloe Cranston and I'm Business and Human Rights Manager at Anti-Slavery International and I'm moderating today's discussion. So I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Greens EFA Group in the European Parliament. Today we will be discussing what's next, solid EU rules to prevent any products made with forced labour ending up on our shelves. We have a really great panel to hear from today, so just to introduce who we have. We have Mr. Claus Michael Stahl, Deputy General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation. He is a lawyer specialised in labour and EU law with long experience in the trade union movement, particularly in collective bargaining. As well as working for many years for the Swedish Blue Collar Union, LO, he has worked at the European Trade Union Confederation as a legal advisor on the services and posting of workers' directives, and also for the Swedish Trade Union Office in Brussels. He's a member of the board of the Swedish Labour Law Association and an author of many publications and reports on a range of trade union issues from democracy to full employment and posted workers. Klaus Michael is married with two children at home and he speaks seven languages. We then have Ms. Anna Cavazzini from Germany, who's been a member of the European Parliament for the Greens EFA since 2019. She fights for a sustainable EU internal market and fair globalization. In short, for fair and sustainable economic structures inside and outside the EU. Since November 2020, she's been chair of the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection. She's also a substitute member of the Committee on Internal Trade and vice chair of the Brazil delegation. Her constituencies are Saxony and Saxony-Anhalt. Before becoming an MEP, she herself worked in the European Parliament for the Federal Foreign Office and the UN and was an advisor to various NGOs. Lastly, but not least, we have Mr. Reinhard Putakova, MEP for the Greens EFA. He sits on the Committee of Foreign Affairs, where he serves as, serves as Greens EFA Foreign Affairs spokesperson and on the Committee of International Trade as a substitute member. He's a chair of the European Parliament's delegation for relations with the People's Republic of China, as well as a member of the delegation to the United States and a substitute member of the ASEAN delegation. From 2012 to 2019, he was co-chair of the European Green Party, and before being elected to the parliament in 2009, Mr. Butakofer was the co-chair of the German Green Party, Bündnis 90 Die Grünen, and the party secretary general. Prior to that, he served as the chair of the Greens in the federal state of Baden-Württemberg. From 1988 until 1966, he served as a member of the Baden-Württemberg state parliament, and his engagement with the German Greens began when he was elected as a member of the city council in Heidelberg in 1984. Besides his positions in the party and parliament, he's also a member of the Europe Transatlantic Advisory Board, the General Assemb Assembly of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the NABU Club, the Trade Union Verdi, the G German Israeli Society, the German Chinese Dialogue Forum, as well as DGAP, the ECFR, and the IISS. So we have a very experienced and knowledgeable panel here today, and I'm really happy to have them here. So thank you to everyone as well who's here on the YouTube channel, um, and it's great to have everyone joining on the different platforms. Our speakers will speak in English, but there is German interpretation available at all times. So we'll start with short interventions from the speakers, after which we'll have the floor for Q&A for about 30 minutes. And you can ask your questions throughout using the chat function. So before we turn over to the questions, I myself, just from Anti-Slavery International's point of view, will just set briefly out the actual context of forced labour globally. So in 2017, the International Labour Organization estimated that 40.3 million people globally are in modern slavery at any given time, including almost 25 million in forced labour across the world. More than 60% of the people in forced labour are exploited in the private sector, and this is likely linked to the value chains of international businesses providing goods to global markets, including the European Union. This includes an industry such as fashion, agriculture, construction, hospitality, cleaning, logistics, transport, warehousing, mining, and others. It's really in our services and the products we buy. Many of the root causes of forced labor are systemic. This includes poverty, discrimination and marginalization, social exclusion, and weak rule of law. In Anti-Slavery International's view, voluntary corporate efforts of the past decades have failed to protect people from modern slavery. And in fact, corporate practices and business operations in global value chains often contribute to the demand for forced labour. This is through their business models and purchasing practices, a reliance on weak forms of monitoring, such as a reliance on social audits and obstruction of freedom of association, for example. 
So with that context set, I will turn to our speakers. We have the same question for each speaker to, to start with. If each speaker could explain from their perspective why the EU needs to introduce a new law banning forced labour products. I'll start with Mr. Claus and Michael Stahl and um, turn to you to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for that uh, presentation, too. There was a lot of things in that presentation. And, and I should actually also say that most of the, the things that are of uh, great inspire, uh, importance for me is, is the fact that I'm a father of two kids. I think I learned most from, from them, actually, throughout my career. Uh, but but to, to, to the question here on, 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 on forced labor and, 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 and what, what's wrong with that, I think it's two, two things. I'm going to make it very simple to begin with. One is, is that it's morally wrong. Uh, people shouldn't be, 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 be used in, in, in that way. And, and there is so much uh, tragedy coming out of, of, of that. So, so that's the, the moral aspect. But you also have the economic uh, side of it. Uh, it's also bad, bad business uh, collectively and, and, and also on, on, on the more business uh, level uh, because you will, as an economy, be, be stuck on an, an underperforming level. So I, I want to start with that simple answer to this question and I hope we can come back. But it's morally wrong. And and it's it's bad economics, and and we we should not be involved in this kind of, of, of things. That doesn't mean and I think that's something we come to later on with with with, with the proposal that's being discussed now. But it also has it's an external side to it, but it also have an internal side uh, within the European Union. And I, I think we're going to address both of those things. Um, and I think it, when we look at the proposal later on, it's it's going to be easier to address it from in the external side. But but we should not forget in this discussion that it also exists forced labor within the European Union. And that's something we also need to address. But I, I'll start there to get the discussion going a bit. Great, thank you very much. And yes, we should, must recognize that forced labor happens in almost every country around the world. Um, so just turning to Ms. Anna Cavazzini, the same question to you from your perspective, why the EU needs to introduce a law banning forced labour products. And perhaps you can set out a little bit of the context of what current laws we have in the EU as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. And um, hello from the plenary session uh, in Strasbourg. Um, indeed, um, as Klaas and also Chloe, as you have said, uh, it is morally wrong and 25 million people worldwide in forced labor um, this is uh, far too much i think it's really an incredible number if you really look at it um, and it is absolutely clear that all the instruments we had in the past so far like for example voluntary reporting or more labeling or whatsoever um, did not really have consequences or did not really fight uh, at the end forced labor. And I think um, that is why we have to go one step further um, and check which instruments have worked all over the globe, but which instruments probably did not work so much. So um, that is why in the parliament, like one year ago, we had um, started this discussion, especially as Greens, but together with social Democrats, with the left, to push forward this idea of um, an import ban on, on forced labor, because our um, experience has showed that in countries like the US that have such an instrument, um, we have much more tools at hand to successfully um, fight forced labor. And you mentioned um, also that 16 million of those 25 million work actually in our supply chains. So throughout our supply chains, we have a huge um, tool at hand. And um, as Klaas said, it is economically also important to fight forced labor because of course it's a huge dumping uh, exercise that certain companies can do. Um, and it absolutely um, plays against any idea of level playing field. And probably lastly, it is also important, I think, for European consumers, because me as a consumer at the moment, I don't know if I buy a product that is made with forced labor. And I think rightly so, consumers in the EU want to make sure, want to be really sure that the coffee or the bricks or the jeans that they're um, buying are not uh, made with forced labor. And that is why I think we need a new instrument. Thank you very much. And so turning to Mr. Reinhard Bitterkofer, the same question, your perspective as to why the EU needs to introduce a new law banning forced labor products.
Oh, I assume you have um, asked me to speak. I didn't hear. Um... Well, I think we maybe have a tech issue with Mr. Mm -hmm. Buta Mr. Butakova. If we wait a minute to see if it resolves, otherwise we can switch around the questions a little bit. So maybe while we wait for Mr. Butakova to um, rejoin, we'll move forward with some of the other questions. So Ms. Anna Cavazzini has referred to some of the context that we have, that there's currently a debate beginning on a new forced labor law in the EU that would address both imported products and also products produced domestically in the EU, which is what the European Commission is proposing. Um, so the European Commission only uh, a few weeks ago closed its call for evidence for this law and the proposal for this law is expected to come in September. So just thinking about this law, um, and as has been mentioned, the United States already does have somewhat of a comparable law. So to Mr. Claus Michael Stahl, are there any areas that when the EU is designing this law that you believe it can improve upon compared to the US law? And how do you believe this law should be designed? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, uh, well, to, to begin with, I mean, I, th I think that the, the American laws in, in this area is, is probably the most advanced that there is out there. So, so of course, it would be great if we could improve uh, compared to what the Americans are doing. Uh, and, and I think we could... So, so, so the proposal, as it's being discussed right now, it's, as, as I said in the beginning, it, it addresses both internal issues, but also external use. And I'm going to talk with the, about the external side mostly, because I think that's, that's where you find the... Uh, uh, and, and, and the trade union view here is, is that one has to be very practical in, in, in terms of things. What happens? What happens, let's say, in the port of, of Rotterdam or in, in Helsinki or, or Naples or whatever you are, when there is a ship coming in with, with goods on it? And, and, and how, do you, how do you deal with, with the fact that there might be, be forced labor uh, products on board that ship? And as far as I understand, the, the American system is, is built upon the fact that they have homeland security, it's customs involved, and they have lists of of, of, of of production sites that that are are on the on that list and if 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 it's something on that list they they, they get into a situation where where the, the importer has to to, to 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 get the burden of proof that it has not been produced by by forced labor and I think that's that's really a, a good basic structure to, to work on and, and our hope, our uh, demand is, is that that's, as you say, a minimum where to start this uh, legislative proposal. But of course, when you, you, you hear the commission, you get the in, in impression, I get the impression at least, that it might be, be something less uh, ambitious that one is looking upon. And, and it could be some simple exchange of information between national custom authorities or national authorities in one way or another. And I think that would be, be would be, be, be the worst kind of, no, not, not the worst out of it, but, but not as good outcome as one could hope for. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and I don't know where to go from here, really. There's so much to say, but, but uh, because as, 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 well, you here in the panel know this, but you that don't know that much of this, this proposal is that there is not a lot of information out there on what the commission is intending to do. So things are happening very fast, uh, within very short time limits. And, and, and usually there is this scrutiny board, there is an impact assessment, there are a lot of things happening in the legislative process that is not happening this time. And, and I think one of the reasons that we have this is that, well, there was a... Uh, Ursula von der Leyen made a promise in her State of the Union uh, speech last year. But I think the other element is also connected to the TTC, the Trade and Technology Council structure that, that and the negotiations that's taking place with Americans. So there's a lot of pressure coming from the Americans on, 
on forced labor. And, and I think there is a lot of uh, opportunity here that could, could do works work together jointly with with Americans. But I'll stop here, and, and I'm sure uh, Anna has, has more to say, and, 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 and maybe be even more well informed than I am. No, no. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So yes, um, following up on that, it'd be great, Anna, if you were able to kind of add your additional thoughts as to what you believe, how you believe the EU law must be designed in order to be <laughs> ambitious, as Claus has said. And then further, also noting the fact that you are a leading MP on the other file around human rights abuses in um, private sector, in terms of the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, if you could also comment specifically on how you see these two laws interlinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably I start uh, with this question, Chloe, because I think I find it interesting to give a little bit of an overview of, of, for those of you who are not like 100% in the debate. Um, we see more and more the trend um, in the EU to go for so-called autonomous instruments. Um, and we have it a little bit in the classical trade defense, but we also have it in issues like with human rights. And there we have the mandatory due diligence um, legislation upcoming, or we start basically negotiating it in the parliament in September. Um, we have the first labor ban that is hopefully coming uh, in autumn. And then we also have the proposal on deforestation-free supply chains, which of course also has a huge impact uh, on, on, on human rights worldwide and of course also on, on deforestation. So um, I think it is quite interesting and really the way forward to not only try to have an impact via trade agreements um, and try to influence global supply chains via trade agreements, but also via autonomous instruments. So I think this is a big step forward. And I think all of these three pieces of legislation, they are complementary. So they are um, each of them important, but really have different goals. And for example, when you look at the mandatory due diligence legislation, um, it is really a kind of a completely different tool. There is um, unfortunately human rights violations in all our supply chains around the globe. Um, and um, it is important that all European companies, and this will be still up for debate if SMEs are excluded or not, but European companies um, will have to do some due diligence um, exercises and a risk assessment and a risk mitigation if they see human rights violations in their supply chain. So it's really um, for the companies to do these kind of exercise and have a try to do the best effort to mitigate human rights violations. And I think with forced labor, it is really going one step further because forced labor is such a hard and 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 really yeah very very severe human rights violation um you have problems when for example um there's not a fire exit in bangladesh is of course also very severe but i mean forced labor is still one level um up i think and there it is important that we have really an additional tool that gives us much more leverage and that's why we in the parliament um suggested really a proper import ban modeled um, according to the US law that was already just explained to really have their ability to stop products at the border when we think they are made with forced labor or when there's really evidence and um, then also um, force the companies um, to prove, either prove that it was not made with forced labor or um, pay some remedy um, towards the workers if it was made with forced labor. All of this happened already. Also, for example, in the US, there was this very famous uh, case when uh, Top Glove, a, a company, had to pay basically compensation to Malaysian debt um, bonded workers. So we also see that this mechanism works. And so it means due diligence and forced labor really the forced labor ban complement each other um, for very, very severe human rights um, violation cases. Um, in the European Parliament, and I mentioned it also because you asked about the process, we voted on a resolution with a really overwhelming majority. I think almost no MEP voted against it from all groups. It was really interesting um, that we exactly want to have this proper import ban of forced, uh, on forced labor, not just a withdrawal mechanism. This is what the Commission is basically planning, that it should be remedy-centered, um, it should be product-based, so not excluding any small or whatever companies. Um, and um, yeah, it should be really effective. And I think um, this is a very, very strong sign by the European Parliament vis-a-vis -vis the Commission. And we really hope that they take our quite strong resolution into account when designing 
the instrument. And as it was said, we expect it to be published in September or latest October, I guess. Thank you so much. I'm hearing, you know, clear consensus from you and Claus about the need for an ambitious law, puts the burden of proof onto companies to prove their products weren't made for forced labour, stops forced labour products at the border, that we have a remedy-centred model that gets remedy to workers and therefore ensures a positive impact of such a law on workers, so not only protecting EU consumers, and that is product-based and doesn't, for example, exclude SMEs from such obligations. So I think we have Mr. Reinhardt put to cover back, but perhaps without video. So let's see how, how we get. So going back to you, um, Reinhardt, uh, can you explain from your perspective why you believe the EU needs to introduce this law that we're discussing that would ban forced labor products? I apologize for the technical problems, but my technology tells me the camera is on. You don't see me. Um, I think I should drop out and leave uh, the conference to the two colleagues. They're doing fine without me. Thank you. Okay, very sorry to hear that. I also understand that without his video, we weren't able to have German interpretation as well. So perhaps we move on forward, but that is um, certainly a shame. In particular, I believe Mr. Reinhard Butakova would have been able to speak about the importance of this law in particular to address systemic forced labor situations such as the situation of Uyghurs and Turkic and Muslim majority peoples in the Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region currently. Um, so I hope there's another opportunity in the future to hear from him on this subject. That actually leaves us at the um, end of our questions now. So I see if let's see if there's Q&A coming in from the public or otherwise I'll ask more questions. Or oh, Klaus, do you have something you want to add now? Yeah, I forgot to say that how important it is to involve unions. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my, my main uh, my main uh, take here, and that is of course that that we, we, if you construct these type of lists uh, on 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 uh, production sites and so on, one has to understand that there is no bigger network of, of civil society organizations than the trade union movement. In fact, we're almost everywhere uh, where the things are being made uh, in different ways, except, except as those places where you might find problems with, with forced labor. But so, so when you take uh, when, when the discussion on what to put on that list, I think it's very important also to put the connection with trade unions, because this is an area where we really can contribute. And, and, and many of you are probably aware of the, the list of, of uh, different kinds of, of um, uh, uh, breaches of, of, of trade union rights that's taking place. And, 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 and it's made by the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation. And, and, and I think it's important to, to also connect this to, to the right uh, to, to, to bargain collective, freedom of association and, and things like that as, as well. Uh, because that's, those are clear indicators of, of uh, let's say that, that if, if you have a problem with, with freedom of association and right to collective bargaining, that's smoke coming up uh, and, and, and at the bottom you might find fire in, in form of, of forced labor. So, so, yeah, I forgot to say that, but now I said that. Thank you. Yeah, fully agree. And the international labor organizations certainly recognize that the primary way to prevent forced labor is by enabling freedom of association. Um, we still don't have questions coming in from the public. So I'm just going to try to touch on what, one of the points that we were hoping Mr. Reinhard would have covered MEP could have covered. So the situation of Uyghurs and Uyghur forced labor is very heavily in the um, headlines. So I expect those people listening in are aware of that situation. And from Anti-Slavery International's point of view, this is a very specific type of situation. So it's state-imposed forced labor and it's systemic across the entire region. That's also comparable, for example, in Turkmenistan, where the entire cotton industry is based upon the use of forced labor. And so these are situations where companies cannot go to the ground and try and work with civil society and trade unions. The only thing companies can do in Anti-Slavery International's view and in line with all international standards is to leave that situation and to not benefit or profit from the forced labor. So turning to you, Ms. Anna Cavazzini, I'm aware of putting you on the spot just now a little bit because this was supposed to be a question to another speaker. 
Is there anything in particular you would mention about how the EU needs to design this law in order to be ambitious enough to address state-imposed forced labour when it happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Chloe. And of course, also from my side, uh, it's um, very sad that Renat Butiko has to leave. But sometimes, uh, yeah, these technical issues you cannot plan. I had similar situations in the past. So I tried to cover up a little bit for him, but he's obviously um, the most renowned China expert uh, we have. The thing is, um, and you mentioned it correctly, there is um, state imposed forced labor and there is like private sector forced labor and um, the classical import ban as we have it in mind is especially addressing um, the private sector because of course if you want a, common, a company to remedy or to prove that it's not from uh, uh, this cotton is not made from forced labor um, then you cannot do it with state imposed, uh, imposed forced labor this is absolutely clear um, on the other hand it is of course important that in general, companies just don't uh, disengage from a region that is a little bit more tricky. So in general, I think we don't want to comp companies to disengage from a region with this instrument, also not with a mandatory due diligence legislation. We want companies to change their behavior, to check more deeply in their supply chains, to influence basically their, their suppliers in order to really fight forced labor and help the workers. This is very important. But I would also say, if you have such an extreme um, situation like state-imposed forced labor in uh, Xinjiang, for example, then it is impossible for the company to really, um, I guess, check uh, on the ground. Um, and that is why I would also say, if for these extreme cases, I think we have to have the possibility of companies then withdrawing from the region. I get a lot, get a lot of requests from, from journalists. Yeah, what about, for example, the solar industry or the cotton industry if they cannot produce anymore uh, in Xinjiang? But I would really say for me, <laughs> this is not an argument. You cannot even yeah, have the green transition with uh, on the back of people in, in detention camps. So you have to have um, basically a, a solution. I think it also shows that in the past we made mistakes. A lot of companies made mistakes in yeah, making themselves too dependent on certain supply chains from regions where we have um, problems with human rights violations. So I think um, next to the import ban on forced labor that we hopefully we get, we also need to rethink in general um, how to design our supply chains, how to make sure that we are not completely dependent on one single country with really a bad track record on human rights, um, how to probably diversify, make supply chains shorter. For example, in Germany, we had a very powerful solar industry, but because of political mistakes from the past government, this uh, went completely bankrupt. So I think we have to really have a holistic view um, on on the problem of forced labor, not forgetting development aid and so on. So there's even more tools um, that we don't talk about tonight. Thank you very much. Klaus, do you have anything to add on that specific issue? Ooh. Uh, I can try. <laughs> uh, no, but 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 uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. There's two situations we're talking about: state and enforced labor, and then you have the private sector. And I guess this also connects a bit to to, to how you set up this list. Uh, so so the American way is that it's production sites, and I think they want to avoid the that you 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 do it for a region or for 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 a country as a whole or something like that, but because. But then at the same time, if you have the, the burden of proof for, for the company, it might be when you have to deal with state enforced labor that you have to do regional um, things on the list. But it also connects to, to sort of a third problem, I think, and that's mixed products. So let's say that you have one part being made in, in uh, with forced labor, state or private forced labor, and then it's put into something else. Uh, and then you get the component, let's say, saying car now, it might be, 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 be a very small part of it, which brings a fourth problem, and we haven't addressed that at all, and that's what, what do you do with these goods that's made of forced labor? Uh, and, and, and do you destroy it? Uh, do you sell it? Uh, and what's the moral then? <laughs> So, 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 so that's that's really a, a tough question too. But, but uh, it all bring it co comes back, I think, to the whole thing of the list. Who makes the list? How do you get on the list? Can you get off the list if you are a, a, a company and so on? Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, so there there are a lot of things to discuss. Uh, and and I'm 
really looking forward to this proposal and that way to, to, to have this political and, and, and legislative uh, proposal because it's going to be, be an uh, interesting process, I think. Yeah, and I fully agree about the, um, you know, it's not just about a product made so fully with forced labor, but also partly. So with state-imposed forced labor for, um, for example, Anti-Slavery International, we know that the majority of Turkmen cotton comes through Turkey which is the key export country to the EU for fashion. But are, is, would customs be looking at products from Turkey or solely from Turkmenistan? But the bulk of it is actually coming from Turkey. And similarly with Uyghur forced labour, huge amount coming, for example, from numerous countries bordering onto China. And that for us as Anti-Slavery International is why it's part of that burden of proof on companies. They need to be able to map and disclose their supply chains. So not only the top factory, you know, in Bangladesh, which made the made the garment, but actually where is the cotton coming from? Where is the yarn coming from? Or in solar cases, where is the polysilicon coming from and so on? So I think there is a lot to delve into. So just moving away from some of the nitty gritty on the law and going a bit more into the process and speaking to um, you, Ms. Anna Cavazzini, what do you believe are the main points of conflict in the parliament about this law and what are the next steps for the legislation and where do you see the political battles when you're negotiating this file? Mm -hmm. um, I can probably uh, tell you a little bit on the negotiations on the resolution because that showed a little bit where the conflict um, in the parliament probably lies or the conflict. Um, but again, I have to say that this resolution that we voted on and um, that had really a lot of important parameters in was voted almost unanimously, unanimously at the end. So that is um, really, really good. But we had discussions um, in the parliament negotiation team on, for example, the SME exemption. This is a regular recurring topic. Um, where some groups say, ah, we cannot have even more proof, uh, more burden, I mean, on the SMEs. Um, and then we also discussed uh, the question of the remedy-centered um, instrument or the focus on remedies. Um, because of the same reason, some groups were a little bit afraid that it would bring, bring too much burden again to the companies. So these um, are basically the main, that's where the main conflict lines when we negotiated the resolution. Um, and the biggest conflict we have with the Commission, and I explained it already, is that the Commission is going more for a product withdrawal mechanism that is, in my mind, a little bit less or much less ambitious than a proper import ban, because the products are let on the EU market, and then only if there is a complaint or something, the product can be basically withdrawn. But I think a proper customs-based instrument, which would have a much more um, deterring effect um, on companies and would make sure that companies before getting into trouble basically change already their um, behavior. I'm not sure if with this product-based approach this would really work. So these are probably the big um, um, conflict lines. I can understand, and this is what I hear a little bit from the Commission, that it's not easy to design such a doc um, instrument because, of course, in the Parliament we just so far voted on a political resolution. So we are having the political paragraphs and we don't have to legally design it. I can imagine that it's not super, super easy um, to make it really right. Um, and as Klaas already said, I think there was also now some time pressure because indeed um, President von der Leyen announced it last week in her last year in her State of Union. Um, and I think it would look a little bit bad if one year later the instrument is not out yet. So I think that's why um, they're a little bit under under time pressure, which is of course good because also we as parliament want it still in this term and not uh, drag on, on forever. Um, yeah, so let's see, but I have the feeling in general there is really huge support for the general idea because yeah, we said it at the beginning, morally is crystal clear. I think there's no one that is in favor of forced labor in the European Union. So I think it's very, very clear that every MEP wants to fight it. And this is already a good common ground. Great, thank you so much. And Klaus, maybe just a few brief comments from you as to how would you, how do you believe the European Commission must be involving trade unions in the process of how they design this law? Well, um... I think it, it, it comes very much down to, to the nitty gritty on, on that list because this proposal or, or this legislation that is going to be has to be easy to, to apply. 
uh, because there should be no derogation for small and medium-sized companies. Uh, I think that would be, be absurd at the end of the day that if you are a small company, well, then you can use forced labor products and you don't, you, you don't end up having to, to, to have any obligations whatsoever. So, so, so I think there has to, it has to be very clear. And, and, and the best way of doing that is to get a good list uh, easy to, to, to follow. So if you're Im importing, let's say, from, from this production site or even from this uh, region, uh, then, then you're in trouble. And, and the way to involve uh, trade unions will be in the setting up of that list. What companies get onto that list? Not that trade unions should make the decisions or anything like that, but it's certainly trade unions that need to, to be a big and important part of, of, of of getting input uh, to that list. I think that's how it works in practical ways also in, in the United States. It's, it's an I think it's the, the Homeland Security. They have some, some kind of structure there. And uh, so, so, so that, I think that's going to be some of the nitty gritty parts of, of the, the proposal. And I should also say that we, we are very, very happy about from the trade union moment about uh, the report from the European Parliament. It's it's a great work and 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 uh, pointing out all the ways. And just as Anna is saying, you 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 don't find a lot of people around saying that it's it's no moral problem with, with forced labor. In fact, uh, you will have a hard time finding any fun doing that. I think that momentum needs to be used too, so you don't get into a situation where well, some people say, oh, it's too, 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 too difficult or something like that. So let's make it simple, like makes it easy and, 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 and keep the, the well, high moral ground that we should be in uh, in this. And, and not forget that it's also bad economics, as I said in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a question in from someone in the public. It is to an extent what you already talked about, um, Ms. Anna Cavazzini, it's around the interaction between the trade ban on forced labour and the EU due diligence directive. So maybe if you could just um, reiterate kind of how you see in the most simplistic, simplistic terms the fact that these are two not interchangeable instruments. So how do they achieve different objectives? Yeah, I would say, thank you for the question. I would say the mandatory due diligence is like a safety net basically for all products, for all supply chains, for all human rights violations, including also environmental human rights violations. Whereas um, the forced labor import ban is much more targeted and stronger because forced labor is, is a much the strongest, one of the strongest human rights violations or more severe human rights violation um, that is there. And one functions via company law that company have, companies have to do proactively the checking or the mapping of their supply chains, whereas the import ban on forced labor, as we imagine it, um, would be really an instrument where, for example, NGOs or United Nations, ILO, could basically go to the EU customs and say, okay, this in this container from this in this country supposedly has forced labor products, so we stop this at the border. So it's really two separate instruments and with two separate targets complementing each other. Okay, that sounds very clear. So I'm going to give the public 10 more seconds to ask a question. And if not, um, we will wrap up here and I'll allow Klaus and Anna to have one last thing they want to say just in case they have one last thing or for, for example a message to european commission as they design the law over the next let me quickly do some maths three and a half months if that's right um and then otherwise we'll close up for the evening i don't see anything coming through so yes any last messages clause perhaps to you to the european commission um yeah, uh, high ambitions. Uh, I think we, we 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 should actually make a difference uh, by by making a proposal that that is is. So so, so I think that the risk here uh, is that the Commission says, oh, we 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 take it step by step. We 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 don't construct a whole system. Let's have some exchange of information, and and I think that would be a mistake. I think we should go for for a full structure. Uh, and, 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 and align ourselves to the United States 
and, and, and ensure that we actually can use the TTC as well uh, as a way of, of, of uh, building a joint system. Because what we do together, Europe and, and, and the United States, will make a difference uh, globally uh, and, and to fight back forced labor. And, and, and um, so, so that would be my advice to the commission. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. And Anna, what would your final message to the Commission be as they work on this file? Yeah, uh, designing a legislation that is uh, close to what the Parliament wants, because anyhow afterwards we have to work on it. Um, and also, secondly, um, coordinate an international forum in the G7, G20, to have even other countries on board. I mean, we have now this effect that the US has a legislation, Canada, I think also Australia is thinking about it, the UK has um, a softer version of it, but nevertheless, so I think even the more uh, countries um, globally um, join forces, um, the more effect have at the end. And I also probably have one uh, pr proposal to the audience. I think it's also always important to have um, public pressure um, throughout the negotiations um, to make also clear that EU citizens want that. I think this will definitely help. Thank you very much. And yes, I suppose final message from me is um, definitely fantastic if MEPs, trade unions, NGOs and the public can all work together in order to make sure that this law is as ambitious and meaningful as possible. So thank you so much to Ms. Anna Cavazzini and Mr. Claus Michael Stahl and also to Mr. Reinhard Butukova, who unfortunately had to drop out today. It's really interesting to hear your thoughts and looking forward to working together more in the future on this file. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.